We're back live on the Alex Jones Show, Tuesday, October 13th edition. And I'm joined by my guest, Gad Sad, who is an evolutionary behavioral scientist at the John Molson School of Business, Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Now, some of the subjects he's been focusing on recently have kind of intersected with my interests. He tweeted out um, one of my videos about feminism. So we're going to talk about radical feminism. We're going to talk about social justice warriors and the progressives who have abandoned truly liberal principles. We're going to cover a raft of issues today. And it's Gad Sad, G-A-D-S-A-A-D, youtube.com slash Gad Sad. Gad, welcome to the show. Yeah, good to be with you, Paul. So let's just start off by explaining some of your background and how it led you to becoming involved in some of the issues that we're going to cover today. So going back to sort of my, my childhood background, my ethnic background, you mean, or my academic background? Your academic background. So I study basically uh, how to apply evolutionary psychology in the context of uh, consumer behavior. So I look at the biological underpinnings that make us consume the way that we consume. And an inherent part of being an evolutionary psychologist is to recognize that there are innate realities. Some of these innate realities manifest themselves uh, in sex differences. So there are many things that men and women are similar on. And then there are other things that we should expect a difference if we look at the evolutionary challenges that each sex has had to face. And so in that context, I have had a chance to interact with a lot of uh you know, feminists and social constructivists and postmodernists, a wide range of social scientists and humanities folks who reject the some of the ideas of evolutionary psychology precisely because it goes uh, frontally against some of their most cherished beliefs. And so that's how, if you like, academically, I, I'm vested in this uh, in this debate. So you've committed the thought crime, basically, of asserting the fact that there are differences between men and women. You've been attacked for that by feminists, by social justice warriors, because now we've got an environment of political correctness. We've got this uh, censorious environment where if you dare speak out, if you dare challenge the consensus on any of these issues, there's a whole machine of public shaming, of social media shaming that will attack you based on these you know, politically correct narratives that they have to defend because if they're exposed, then it will bring down their entire narrative. So let's get into political correctness. Sure. Which, of course, is, you know, it's, it's, it's reached insane levels. We had the University of New Hampshire a couple of months ago saying, you can't use the word American because it might offend people from South America. You know, they're saying the use of the word mothering or fathering could offend somebody. We've got trigger warnings at universities. <laughs> Just break down, you know, the origins of political correctness and the true agenda behind it today? Well, I mean, I think that the sort of the title of your website, Infowars, speaks exactly to this issue, right? I mean, if you wish to win the cultural wars, if you wish to win the battle of ideas, you could either engage people on equal footing, right, where you each evaluate the merits of the opponent, and then hopefully the best idea wins. Or if you don't feel comfortable in so doing, maybe perhaps because you might end up losing the battle of ideas, then you come up with all sorts of mechanisms to shut down debate, right? So if I am a uh, authoritarian dictator somewhere, I could shut down debate by making it illegal. <clears throat> I mean, I could kill you if you say something that is contrary to the official doctrine. In the context of the West, uh, you can't quite behead people, but what you can do is you could behead their reputation, you could behead... Uh, uh, you know, all sorts of things that are important to them. And that's exactly what happens with political correctness. It is a means by which people are so afraid to openly speak about positions that they hold, uh, cherished positions that they hold, that they will self-censor. And hence, their voices have been beheaded, so to speak. And that's the key, really, isn't it? I mean, that's why I see, you know, the main force of censorship not coming from the state anymore. It's coming from within the culture because if you create this standard by which people are terrified to even open their mouths in the first place for fear of what might happen, for fear of what their peers might say, you don't even really need the hard core censorship to come in after that because people won't even utter these kind of statements in the first place. And that's, that's, the, that's the essence of political correctness, right? It's about restricting thought because as you said, 
these progressives, these social justice warriors don't believe in equality. They don't believe in the logic of one argument winning over another on a level playing field, correct? Absolutely. And, and you know, what is even more disheartening is that this, this cancer of political correctness is not something that sort of afflicts uh, the average Joe walking in the street. It actually afflicts the people who should be leading the discourse. So think about all the intelligentsia. Think about the people, the professors in the ivory tower, right? They are the ones who should be leading this exchange. And, and oftentimes, I hate to say it, uh, they are some of the most cowardly folks. They are some of the folks who are most infected with the cancer of political correctness, precisely because they belong to a club, let's call it the, historically it was called the progressive club, but now many people are using the term, which I love, the regressive left. Uh, and so they don't want to ever be ostracized from that group. So even though they might privately write to me or privately when we're having an espresso say, you know what, I, I frankly support a lot of the things that you say openly, but I'm, I don't feel comfortable saying it in public. Uh, they won't like something that I put up on Facebook because even liking it might somehow get them feathered and tarred. So it's really Orwellian. I mean, it is scary that people are so insecure about their cherished beliefs that they engage in this type of self-censorship. And as you said, you know, a lot of professors are afraid to make what they fear may be politically incorrect statements because whereas once they, they embraced classical liberalism, you know, they were tolerant of debate. They were tolerant of a free exchange of ideas. Now, They've been influenced to such an extent by the people who are completely intolerant that they kowtow, they self-censor their beliefs to appease those people. There was an interesting interview with Stella Murabito. Uh, she gave an interview to The Daily Caller a couple of days ago. And this is basically a former intelligence analyst who describes herself as a left winger. But she made the point that politically correct thought control and, you know, the elite narratives that are reinforced through it they do it, as you just, you know, touched upon then, via social isolation and peer pressure. It's the threat of what other people, God forbid, might think if you dare express uh, an independent opinion, something mildly controversial, which ties into a, an interesting video that you did, which I saw a couple of days ago, about the Solomon Ash conformity yeah. experiment, which we briefly touched upon earlier in the show. So tell us about this study and what it tells us about how strong a force the desire to conform really is. Right. So when, whenever I teach, you know, my, you know, consumer psychology or psychology of decision making, I often will begin by lecturing about some of my favorite psychology experiments of all time. And usually what they have in common is that they are very, very simple experiments that demonstrate something that is extraordinarily powerful about human nature. And so in the case of Solomon Ash, this was a social psychologist who in the 50s decided to test people's proclivity to conform. And here, to conform to stimuli that are otherwise not very ambiguous, right? So we're not talking about the real world where everything is gray, where it is unclear what is the right action to take. So here's what he basically did. He brought in a bunch of people and he had one line and then next to it, three other lines. One of those three other lines was the same length as the, yeah, great, I'm, I'm glad you're showing it. So it, it's clear to anybody who's got, you know, normal vision, which of the three lines A, B, C should be the one that is the same as the line on the left. And so what he would do is he'd, he'd bring in people and then he'd have a bunch of confederates, meaning these are fake subjects who are not really subjects, are they pretending to be subject, but there's really only one true subject. And so he would ask each of those people, please tell us which of the three lines A and B and C are the same as, as the line on the left. And each of the Confederates, I mean, depending on the condition that, of the experiment, would utter out, you know, in public openly, uh, the wrong answer. And so what he was doing there is he's setting up the conditions to see whether the actual participant, who would be the last guy in line, whether he would say, well, what are you talking about? No, sorry, guys, that's the wrong line. You're wrong. Or whether he would conform. And the reality is that a non-trivial number of people. I mean, different conditions resulted in different compliance rates, but certainly quite a substantial number of people would go against their eyes and simply conform to group pressures. Now, again, what makes this study so powerful is that this is not an ambiguous stimulus. It should be clear to any sane person who is who has, you know, reasonable vision what the true answer is. 
but yet my desire to conform to the group is greater than my lying eyes. So there you go. And, you know, as you mentioned, in, in some cases, it was literally 38, 39% of people who said what was clearly the wrong answer. You can see from the example that we just showed on screen, it's obvious which line is the same length as the line on the left, but because seven other people before them had given a different answer, and these were stooges in this experiment, they chose the same answer simply to conform to the peer pressure, obviously knowing that it was the wrong answer. And we also see this conformity in fashion, correct? Because we follow the herd. Again, I was buying, I was trying to buy jeans a few weeks ago. I was on a, a website, a clothing website. Now we know that, you know, a lot of fashion designers are homosexuals. They're gay men. Fair enough. As long as the clothes look good, I don't care. But literally every single pair of jeans was rolled up with no socks. So I was like, I don't wear jeans without socks. I don't wear jeans that are rolled up. So I can't see what they look like with shoes on. Literally every pair of jeans on the website was like this because that's the fashion. And if you don't conform to that, then, you know, you're going to have problems. You're going to get socially isolated in some circumstances. So this conformity also applies to fashion, correct? Yeah, that's a perfect point because I, I actually use this exact example in my books where I argue that fashion is nothing but a big conformity experiment. Either you've independently thought of this or you've been reading my books uh, because that's exactly what it is, right? You, you create a cue of, in French we say appartenance or belongingness, right? To, th today, to be part of the, fa the in fashion group, you have to wear brown. That's it. There is some dictum that says that brown is in. Well, we all rush and buy brown. Well, next season, brown is the evil color. It's now green. Well, we all drop our evil brown and we rush to buy green. So it is exactly catering to some innate need to belong, which in this case manifests itself in the fashion industry. I'll tell you a very quick story. A few years ago, the fashion was at least amongst uh, you know young women of university age to wear UGG boots. Are, are you familiar with UGG boots? Yeah, sure, you know, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I I would not be engaging in hyperbole if I were to tell you that probably 50 percent of the female students in my at least undergraduate classes were wearing Ugg boots. So much so that you would almost think that my university had that as part of its dress code. Like you <laughs> had to wear Ugg boots. Otherwise, somehow you wouldn't be allowed entrance into the school. And of course, now I don't see them wearing Ugg boots. So this. This need to conform manifests itself in, in endless ways. And regrettably, in the context of political correctness, it manifests itself in these insidious ways. We're talking to Gad Sad. His YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash Gad Sad. Twitter at Gad Sad. Go and check out some of his videos. Excellent content. Let's go to feminism now, because of course, you shared one or two of my videos on feminism. And you touched upon it on the intro there. You know, modern feminists are loath to acknowledge the fact that there are these fundamental differences between men and women. It's not enough to say that men and women are better suited to different tasks, but still equal. That's not good enough. So from your background in evolutionary psychology, why is there this drive to homogenize the sexes? And why is it so fundamentally unscientific? Well, I think it starts, if I'm going to be charitable towards them, I would say the following. It starts from a the laudable goal of trying to eradicate institutionalized sexism. Now, we can all agree that if feminism is about making sure that men and women are equal in all of the various ways, politically, economically, socially, then, of course, we can all uh, buy into that uh, grand objective. Now, here's what where they make the mistake. They think that... In the pursuit of equality, it is easier to have a narrative that says that the two sexes are fundamentally indistinguishable from one another, because that simply doesn't allow any sexism to seep into the narrative. If you concede that men and women are very similar in some ways and very different in others, this lends a weaponry, if you'd like, for sexism to be maintained. And so they start off with a laudable premise. And they, of course, wrongly think that by arguing that the two sexes are biologically distinguishable, this means that sexism will always exist, which is, of course, nonsense. So 
it, so if I'm going to be charitable, I would say that that's where 